Today's episode of Beyond the Mask is presented by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. Get a free consultation today to be guided through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Just visit crnafinancialplanning.com. Beyond the Mask is also sponsored by crnaeducation.com. CRNAs, you can get the CE credits you need by just going to crnaeducation.com. They have over 100 AANA prior approved credits, all four core CPC modules, and even over 40 pharmacology credits. No subscriptions, it's all online and mobile friendly. Just go to crnaeducation.com. And don't forget, listening to our podcast can earn you Class B credits. For more information on how you can submit them, check out our CE credit tab on our website. BeyondTheMaskPodcast.com. Welcome to Beyond the Mask, innovation and opportunities for CRNAs and advanced practice nurses with certified financial planner Jeremy Stanley and CRNA Sharon Pierce. Jeremy Stanley has worked with CRNAs for more than 23 years, and Sharon Pierce is a former president of the AANA and the NCANA. Join us as we leave the operating room and learn the latest in the CRNA and advanced practice nurse industries. Beyond the Mask starts in 10, 9, 8, 7. Hey there, this is Sharon. I'm in Seattle, Washington at the annual Congress, and unfortunately, Jeremy has not arrived to the meeting yet. However, listeners, I've been joined by one of our new guest co-hosts, Tracy Castleman. She's not so new anymore. I've broken her in pretty good. And Tracy has been a longtime friend of mine and is one of the group I affectionately call the Fab Four. Tracy, thank you for joining me. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before we kick off our topic today? Thank you so much for having me here. It's um, so much fun to be back in Seattle. Um, I am Tracy Castleman. I have been a nurse anesthetist practicing for far too many years at this point. I practice in New Jersey. I come from New York. I sat in a variety of leadership positions, but nothing as fun as doing this with you. Oh my gosh, you're so sweet. So today we have a great topic and um, another person who's in the Fab Four. We're excited today to have two presidents of IFNA with us, the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists. Sandy Ouellette, who does our historical series, served as IFNA president from 2004 to 2010. And Jackie Rolls, who is the third of the Fab Four, is the current president of IFNA. And today we're going to discuss the globalization of the nurse anesthesia specialty with emphasis on a 34-year journey and the future of the Federation. So welcome, ladies. So welcome. It's good to be here. Back in Seattle, wonderful weather. New convention center. Yes, it is nice. nice. Everything's it nice. Is nice. Lots it of is. new things. Uh, lots of good changes. Yes. Yes, it is. So we'll just go ahead and kick this off because all of us have got to be at a foundation meeting here shortly. So Sandy, why don't you tell us about the steps leading to the founding of the IFNA? Okay, well, in 1977, two European nurse anesthetists attended the ANA Congress in Detroit, Michigan. That year, Ronald Koch, the late Ronald Koch, was ANA president, and a friendship developed between him John Gard, who was on the staff then, and Hermie Lonard. And Hermie was a nurse anesthetist in uh, Switzerland. Now, the importance of that was prior to that time, we were told by some anesthesiologists in the United States, quote, the U.S. is the only civilized country in the world to allow nurses to administer anesthesia. Well, when these two, Fran Hansen and Hermie Lonard, showed up, we knew there were at least two more countries to add to the list. At that Congress, a seed was planted for what would become the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists. Now, the next steps. Well, once you have the seed planted, what do you do? Well, you have a meeting. And so at the Congress, uh, the first international symposium was held in Lucerne, Switzerland in 1985. I had the honor to attend that. I was on the ANA board at the time. 
it, it was a financial bust, I'm here to tell you, but boy, did we have fun. <laughs> well, was, that's because your bar that, tab was so high. <laughs> what we learned was that although we all spoke our native language, and that was about it, um, if you put, at the end of the day, a band, a keg of beer, and some popcorn in a room, <laughs> we all did very, very well together. And a bunch of CRNAs. And, <laughs> and we had so much fun that we decided, let's do this again. So the second international symposium was held in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, in 1988. In 1989, a decision had been made that this would be a formal organization. And the ANA board supported a trip for me, who served as president of ANA at the time, and Ron Kalk, who was the ANA appointee to this new whatever it was going to be, to go to Seoul, Korea, and then Teufen, Switzerland, uh, to first learn what to do, and second, to form the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists. That trip took us and our spouses around the world. In about 20 um, some days, we wow. had a great time. And so in May of 1988, we were in Seoul, Korea, and the purpose was to observe how the old well-established International Council of Nursing functioned. We attended the 19th Quadrennial Congress where we met nursing leaders from around the world and leaders of the Korean Association of Nurse Anesthetists, which was founded by an American CRNA Catholic sister, Sister Margaret Comer. I would not have survived in Korea without Sister Margaret at that meeting, and, and she was just wonderful. And Greta Stiles, very um, iconic leader of the ANA and also the ICN at the time helped us a lot, as did Judith Olton in terms of, uh, she was the executive director of ICN, what to do. So we then, armed with our new knowledge, left and went to Teufen, Switzerland, where country representatives, there were 11 country representatives there, adopted the bylaws. And on June 10th, 1989, the founding charter was signed by representatives from 11 countries. Now I want to tell you kind of how that was. As I said, everybody spoke their own native language. We had no cell phones. We had no internet. The most sophisticated communication we had was a fax machine. Mm -hmm. But we had determination and we had a plan. And so we thought this is going to be a big thing, but we didn't know what to do really. And I can tell you, when I look back on those days, it is an absolute miracle that IFNA exists today because it, it was sort of a struggle going forth. So that's how it started. Well, so you had to develop a governing, governing structure mm -hmm. for IFNA, and how did that happen? Well, we modeled that, Sharon, after the ICN and a council of national representatives. So what this is, it's a federation, which means it's a membership by countries, okay? Mm -hmm. So the governing structure is called the CNR, the Council on National Representatives. And it initially consisted of a president, a vice president, Hermie Leonard, which is known as the founder from Switzerland of IFNA, was the first president, and Ron Kalk, the ANA appointee, uh, was the first vice president. And then there was a secretary, Hannah Bridges' daughter from Iceland, and then a treasurer, Sven Olesen from Norway. And there's one voting representative from each country. So each person has one representative and they get one vote, regardless of how many members you have in that country. Later, an executive director was uh, appointed, which then kept the minutes, so we didn't need a secretary at that point, so we then had a second vice president added um, at that point. Now, early on, we thought that there needs to be some committees. And so one of the very important committees uh, was the executive committee, which consists of four officers and six elected CNR, and then uh, an education committee. Now, I was not on the original education committee. I thought I was, but I wasn't. But I chaired the education committee. You just told them all what to do. I, right? I, I, chaired, I 
chair of the Education Committee from about 1990 until about 2004, when I became the appointee from ANA and the president at the same time. And uh, so the Education Committee has been very, very influential, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then from the very beginning, we had uh, also um, a Congress Planning Committee, and we'll talk about that, and very, very important in terms of its structure, because we're getting ready to go into the 15th a World Congress of Nurse Anesthetists, so it's going to be very exciting. So that was our original beginning. Now, interesting, this was all formed in the attic of a building in Little Teufen, Switzerland. And you woke up in the morning with the cows going out to pasture, with the little bells around their neck, and um, it was so important, and you know, people shared rooms. Well, my husband was with me, so I shared a room with my husband. But some people shared rooms as we were forming this. And I remember Ron Cox saying one time, he shared a room with Sven Olison one night. At two o'clock in the morning, Sven was still talking, and he said, Sven, it's two o'clock in the morning. You have got to be quiet. We have a meeting tomorrow. He said, quiet, quiet. You can be quiet when you're in the home pulling on your catheter. What he meant was, <laughs> when you're in the nursing home <laughs> yeah. pulling on your catheter, <laughs> that's when you can be quiet. We got work to do. <laughs> I never will forget that. And unfortunately, Sven died early of pancreatic cancer. He was a wonderful, wonderful guy. See, he knew he had to get out what he had to say. That's right. That's right. So I had to get that story, and I'll do it tomorrow too, Jackie, in our presentation. <laughs> so Jackie, besides being able to master how to say all those names, um, Thank you. tell us about um, the changes in the governing structure and what it looks like today. Really, there haven't been many changes since I came in in 2010. And thank you, Sandy, for supporting me for the position. Yeah. To today, we still have the same structure for our elected smaller board within the full board that manages in between meetings. And we only have full CNR meetings every two years. So we have the officers meet every fall along with Congress Planning Committee. And then in the spring, we either have the Executive Committee, which is the officers and the six at large elected, along with Practice, Education, and CPC Committee. Then the opposite year, it's the full CNR. So that's what our bylaws say, every two years. We currently have 43 member countries. Two wow. of those, though, are their associate members, which means there's more technicians than nurses mm -hmm. or all technicians. And it's a little bit different. We feel like we are working to raise quality of care of anesthesia. And if there's technicians, they need help. They don't have an organization internationally. And so they come in to us. They do not have voting rights, but they have the ability to speak at meetings. They take the standards, the revisions. They're, they're active in our association, and because they really are trying to raise their education and care. You're giving them the building blocks, we are giving which them is the fantastic. Blocks, and we do not have any political problems with that. The practice committee, it was education committee for a while, practice committee was added. At one point in time, practice went away. <laughs> Came back in 2010 when Sandy rolled off as the rep from the US and chaired the practice committee. And we got a lot of work done. <laughs> there because we there are a lot of work to be split although those practice and education committees do work in together on a lot of things cpc committee is the same it's made up of the chair of the prior congress chairs that committee and then the chair of the upcoming congress and the four officers and our executive director and you so, also have the national organizing committee yeah, which is very important when we pick where we are going for a meeting that national association hires a professional congress organizer so they're working boots on the ground there, and then we're working with them. We meet every six months, and we are working together to fill the scientific program, and if not overseas, really. All of it, we can give them a loan if they need money to get started and then be paid back from proceeds of the Congress. Does the Congress make money? The Congress, usually, usually it does. Usually does. We did not make money in The Hague in 2010. Uh, we had to cancel the Congress in Tunisia in 2015 because I remember of the that. unrest. Mm -hmm. So we lost money that we had mm -hmm. given them to get started. We had a no loss guarantee in Glasgow, which was a good thing because we would have lost money there because the convention center was very expensive. But our last Congresses have made money and a pretty good amount of money. And then 10% of that profit goes into our foundation, the Ithna Foundation. 
I don't even know if I knew that there was a fa IFNA foundation. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that either. Education Research Foundation. Education and mm -hmm. research, and we fund people that are doing research. And you can also apply for a, a student exchange program, which we haven't funded anyone at this point. But we have funded research that has really helped. We funded uh, Christian Heron from Switzerland did his PhD, and he was matching the IFNA standards to Switzerland mm. to see if they were meeting all of our standards. And then that could be applied to other countries. Gaesun Jung from Korea, who's on our education committee, did a joint research with one of the Korean nurse anesthetists here in the United States and looked at Korean practice of nurse anesthetists, which was very timely because there was a move in Korea at that time by the anesthesiologist to require full supervision of a nurse anesthetist. And they were able to bring data into the government to show exactly what nurse anesthetists were doing. So um, the educational grants, do they have to support international? They do. OK. They have to support international, and they are supposed to be, if you're doing it jointly, it has to be done with a member of IFNA. OK. And our education committee looks at those requests first and then they make a recommendation, recommendation to the board whether we should fund or not. So Sandy, was this part of the original conversation of getting IFNA together, or is this no, the uh, natural growth? No, we did growth? think about Educational Research Foundation at the time. That came later. Okay. But it came before I left the presidency of IFNA. And Ronald Kalk, again, had a lot to do with that. And you can see a lot of what we did, even though we're a federation, was modeled after the AIFA and mm -hmm. what the a and was this was our experience mm -hmm. and the people were um, were very supportive of that as long as it wasn't too american <laughs> it was an international organization that makes sense yes yeah Attention all certified nurse anesthetists. Are you in need of a reliable and quality continuing education option? Well, look no further than crnaeducation.com. We are an NBCRNA recognized provider offering all four core CPC modules to meet your certification requirements. You can choose from more than 100 AANA prior approved Class A CE credits with 43 articles covering a wide range of anesthesia topics. Need pharmacology CE credits? Well, we've got you covered there as well, with over 40 pharmacology CE credits available. All credits are completed online and are mobile friendly. Choose articles worth one, two, or three credits. There's no subscriptions, no hidden fees, just the CE credits you need when you need them. Owned by CRNAs since 2011, you can trust in our commitment to your education. And customer service is always a quick email or phone call or even text away. To sign up and find out more about our education options, visit crnaeducation.com, your partner in continuing education. That's crnaeducation.com. So Jackie, what do we know today about the need for nurse anesthetists on the global stage? Well, I always lecture on it from what I call the 10,000 foot view, mm -hmm. because we could talk about it all day. But there's been a lot of research done by the World Health Organization, the United Nations, had put together in 2015 a resolution that 80% of the world's population would have access to surgery when and where they need it by 2030. I don't think we're going to get there. But basically, the Lancet Commission had a global surgery report in 2015, and the G4 Alliance has been working on it. We know that, one, well, 5 billion people out of the world, 7 billion, do not have access to safe, affordable, and timely surgical care and anesthesia wow. when, the, when and where they need it. It's awful. We know that back in 2010, almost 17 million lives were lost due to untreated surgical conditions, and that people don't think about us as anesthetists and surgery as contributing to universal health care. They think it's all primary care. But one third of surgeries can help to actually treat disease. So think about mm. you're doing an appendectomy. We've just cured that if that's all the patient came in for, right? So surgery, one third of the burden of global disease can be cured by surgery. That's a lot. Wow. So now we're starting to be recognized and respected more on the global stage because of these figures. We know the poorest one-third of the world's population only receives 6.3 of all surgical procedures. That's incredible. Our surgical deficit has been estimated at approximately 143 million procedures a year, 
and the cost of increasing surgical capacity at $350 billion. Wow. However, the cost of not investing in essential surgical care and anesthesia is estimated at $12.3 trillion. So we're talking about healthcare costs and lost productivity. Does any of this are disabled. does this include OB as well? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now the United Nations report found that surgical care has a one to ten cost benefit ratio. So every dollar we spend, we're getting ten dollars in return. So it seems like a slam dunk, mm-hmm. right? That ministers of health and countries, governments should be investing in this. They haven't until the last few years. We also know anesthesia mortality and morbidity is three times higher in low and lower middle income countries. Another thing I just want to point out on my soapbox that I've lectured for years to the physician meetings about is task shifting. Mm -hmm. I hate the term task shifting. It actually started during AIDS. And the World Health Organization used it to say we need to train nurses and advanced practice nurses and PAs and other providers to help manage patients with AIDS. It has crossed over into physicians versus nurses. And they're saying, oh, we're training a nurse instead of a physician because we don't have enough physicians and that it's some lower level. So I always say at these meetings, when we are educated in anesthesia, it's not task shifting. That is what we are educated for and capable of doing. So therefore, you are not shifting a task to me. That's my task. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting because the World Health Organization agrees. And they're the ones that started this term. So while the anesthesiologists actually did a little better and they moved to task sharing and there are some publications now that talk about task sharing with us we've all now agreed after face-to-face meetings with them on workforce optimization and we're going to talk about workforce optimization and not task shifting or sharing sounds a little bit more palatable to be sure well it sounds appropriate and more respectful yes yeah Mm -hmm. thank you jackie for leading that absolutely Absolutely. So, Sandy, why don't you tell us about uh, IFNA activities that are focused on demonstrating and advancing quality care? Mm -hmm. Well, from the very beginning, uh, IFNA had an eye on uh, quality care outcomes internationally. So, in addition to the formation of IFNA, one of the first things was a practice education committee that, as Jackie said, just became an education committee, and then in 2010, it divided out into a practice committee again. So as chair of the uh, education committee, the first thing we did is draft, and it was approved by the CNR Educational Standards of Practice. It was followed by practice standards, monitoring guidelines, which later became monitoring standards and uh, ethics. Um, And all that was done in 1990, 91, 92, every year we approved something. Now, it was pretty easy then because remember I said that everybody spoke their, their own language and so I was on a committee with four other people from different countries who English was not their first language. And again, I modeled a lot after what I knew was our standards and they would just shake their head because Um, They thought it was pretty good what I was saying, although they may not have understood really. (laughs) It became, when we revised them many years later, uh, 2016, not near near as easy because by then, all of our country representatives in IFNA, they they, uh, they had very good English. Of course, for me, some people would say English wasn't my first language either, coming from the South. However, and you know, it became harder. They were all educated at a master's or doctoral level, and, and that's good because they had a lot, a lot more, uh, more input. The other thing is that the meeting in 1997, uh, I think, in um, Vienna, we had um, Dr. Marjorie Lynn Peace, who was uh, known as International Quality Assurance in Education out of Washington, D.C. She was our keynote speaker. She gave us five steps to the globalization of a profession. So between 1989 and 1997, we had done all of those except one thing. We did not have quality assurance Mm -hmm. in international education. So at that time, Betty Horton had been brought on 
as uh, chair of the education committee and you may recall that Betty um, directed our credentialing, our council of accreditation for many, many years. You couldn't find a better person, more knowledgeable person. And she came in and developed what is known as the anesthesia program approval process, which is short, uh, short would be APAP. It's uh, quality assurance for anesthesia programs, which was implemented the year I left office. And that was the fifth box to check for a global organization. And APAP is doing well now. Its goals are to encourage programs to comply with IFNA standards and to promote health of humanity by promoting educational standards. It is the belief if nurses are used in anesthesia and left alone, they must be educated. And the categories are three. The lowest category to be is recognition, Follow, uh, is registration followed by recognition followed by accreditation. And I thought, well, a program in the U.S. will be the first to be accredited. It was not. It was a program in France, as I recall. And uh, since June uh, 2010, there's 32 programs or more that have been approved in one of those processes. We were the first, according to WHO, we were one of the first to develop a quality assurance internationally, globally. Very wow. proud of that. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, shout out to Betty Horton because I don't think anybody else could have uh, given us the br blueprint like she did um, uh, for that. So so that's that's really good. So we set the uh, stage, and as Jackie said many times, we begin with getting our internal house set. And after many many years, uh, Jackie then has gone. Uh, miles and miles in collaborative external relationships and so now it's time to show what we've done to the rest of the world and she's doing that very very well. I will say when we met with the WFSA this year our leadership and theirs they asked me how did you guys do that APAP program because we've talked about it and we just can't find a way to make it work. Tell her to hire Betty Horton as yeah, there you go. <laughs> she'll do it for you. You need Betty Horton. That's right. There you go. So Jackie, obviously, as Sandy has said, you have taken this miles and miles. So talk to us about the goals of advocacy and the future of IFNA through advocacy. One thing I saw early on was our international colleagues don't get education in leadership and advocacy. Mm -hmm. They're uncomfortable with going out and promoting themselves many times, and there's not a good platform for them. So we have had to talk about, you've got to go and talk to your minister of health, your parliament, your government, and make sure they know who we are, what we do, where we do it, why we do it, why we're qualified to do it. We've really been working on educating them on the understanding of those roles we have, recognizing us for our expertise, respecting us for what we do, and title protection, because mm -hmm. many countries just have a title of a nurse, which means if you're educated as a nurse, you can get anesthesia. We're trying to get nurse anesthetists, or there's about 18 different titles. Some are high anesthetic officers. Trying to get titles, that means you have to have anesthesia education to actually give anesthesia. And our physician counter counts agree that there should be anesthesia education to do this. So that's good. What I've also said is you have to show up. Mm. Oh, yeah. And early on, IFNA didn't have the money to send Sandy and others to all these meetings. They went to ICN, which we developed really good partners there. But we couldn't go to the WHO meeting, couldn't go to the G4 Alliance. And we didn't have money to send to meet with WFSA. We didn't even meet with us for a while, or the European Society of Anesthesiologists. So we had to watch our spending and put some money away. And now we've been able to do that. And it's not always easy to go and sit there and wait and see if there's going to be anything for me away that's good or we can even weigh in on. But just by being there, we have met many other people that are looking for the same goal. And now we have a really good outreach of collaborations. And for one example, 2015, I went to the ICU meeting in And there was another one of the Asian viruses going around. My husband did not want me to go. <laughs> and I said, I'm going. So the Everything was interesting. You'd walk 10 feet and there'd be another hand sanitizer. And there was no 
uh, concierge lounge open. They canceled all visits to hospitals and tours that they did. And I said, who better to be with? Nurses. Mm -hmm. We all want to take care of ourselves. And so the Asian mask. nurses. Right. <laughs> you wore your mask, you washed your hands. We went to our meetings, and it was a great meeting. But sitting next to me at opening ceremonies was Dr. Jim Campbell, who's CEO of the WHO. Mm. And as CEO, he's in charge of workforce. Just serendipitous. We met, we got along, many meetings. I go to the World Health Assembly, and he'll be there, we'll talk. I was at a meeting of WHO, you used to have a global initiative for essential and uh, emergency care for surgery. And the lead of it said one time, we need nurses here. And Dr. Campbell said, the nurses are here, the nurse anesthetists are here. And I said, yes, we are, but we need more nurses here. But by doing this, when we have things going on, I literally can text him or several handful of other people I've met and get their response and even have them advocate for us. It's been awesome. Just by being there. So what I'm hearing you say is by showing up, by showing up. you're able to get the recognition, which develops the respect, right. and that's how you get towards... And you meet people. Yeah. Wow. And even if you think, well, this is a lot of money to send someone from a small organization, it's been worth it. It has really helped our outreach. I think Sam... Oh, yeah, and, and I think particularly in an international community, there's nothing like networking and face-to-face -face communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these people, even though they're speaking English, they're thinking in their native language. And a lot can be lost, misinterpreted, or misunderstood by Zoom, by electronic I communication. Agree. So it's important to be there. Nobody tells your story better than you do. Right. Right. And That's another right. Thing, just for maybe some of our listeners, I have CRNAs and even students that will come to me and say, well, I want to go volunteer and I'm going to go to the government and we're going to do this the U.S. way. No, you're not. You're going to hurt that country. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the culture. You have to understand the governance. And you have to be professional. And it's hard sometimes. But I will also say the anesthesiologists on the global level are, have been great to work with. It's taken some time, but we all have the same goals. I've been on their manpower survey committee. I've been on an anesthesia definition type committee. I've lectured for the WFSA twice now, and I just lectured again with them at the International Anesthesia Research Society in Denver to present our findings on global manpower. We can find a way to work collaboratively together, and yes, we still have differences. Mm -hmm. So we can find a way to do it. We are so fortunate to have both of you as leaders Absolutely. for so long. And I want to tell you, uh, Jackie's not going to toot her own horn, but she has just been appointed to a United Nations Global Surgery Project. So, so that is huge. Enormous. I mean, huge. Jackie, can you tell us a little about that? Yes. Because of our great relationship with ICN that started back in 1989, this is the only reason we know about it. So here we've been, IFNA's been around all these years, and an invitation about this project went to ICN and asked for them to promote and propose nurses to be on committees of this. So it's the United Nations, I call it the Surgery E-Learning Hub. So it's all online learning, and it's meant to educate the whole perioperative team for free. So we have an online hub, which is now open, and we are, have courses for surgeons, anesthesia practitioners, and perioperative nurses or technicians even. And you can actually go and do any course you want. There's no CE, but I'm on the content committee. That's what I was proposed for by the INCN president. And we, we had to establish the inclusion exclusion mm. uh, requirement, and then we look at all the proposed programs. And because of that, I think because I'm certified in online education through TCU, it was a surprise, I think, for some of the people on the committee. I have nine surgeons, or nine, well, one anesthesiologist from Brazil, and nine surgeons, and me, and a surgical fellow. And I got elected vice chair. Yes. Really are you oh, surprised now? <laughs> Jackie, we are not surprised. <laughs> not at all. I was very surprised uh, because the surgeon, surgical fellow ran, and he huh. asked me to run with other people from the UN and I was elected, and it's, it's a great experience, and I think I'm the only nurse I know on any of the committees right now. And can you imagine not having the voice of nurse anesthesia 
because it's so tightly bound to surgery. Nobody anywhere is going to want surgery without anesthesia. No. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. And in much of the world, there are no physicians to do it. Right. You know, and so it would be a real oversight if that had not happened. Well, that's a, been oversight for how long? Yeah, yes. right, oh yeah, right. I heard the good news is I was picked as an anesthetist. None of us as an anesthetist. But I am representing all of nursing on that committee. It's because I'm the only nurse on that committee. Jackie, if anybody can do it, you can. Yes, yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you. It's, it's actually going pretty well. Uh, we need some more nurse anesthesia education, so I'm going to be reaching out to a few people to see if they will submit courses. Beyond the Mask is made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. With almost two decades of experience, the firm guides CRNAs through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Schedule a free consultation today by calling 855-304-3748 or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. So Jackie, can you um, list and maybe briefly discuss the key collaborators associated with IFNA today? You use a lot of letters when talking. Right. Um, well, the main collaborators for us are the International Council of Nurses, and we just finished a session in Montreal. We haven't had a whole lot there for nurse anesthetists, but we had a, a coffee shop where we talked about history in a book, and they could ask questions, and how we apply the ICN guidelines that were developed between IFNA and ICN on the advanced practice role of the nurse anesthetist globally. That's been really key for our countries as we use that at the governmental levels, parliaments, and just the government themselves to say we need to be recognized as advanced practice. So that's been great. We collaborated with the European Society of Anesthesiologists. We had joint committees for probably about eight years, and then we were a co-sponsor on their patient safety summit right before COVID. I was on the planning committee. We're at an impasse. Mm. right now because they don't want they didn't want to recognize the difference between a technician and a nurse in the anesthesia role mm. so we're sort of at an impasse but I do have a nurse anesthetist on their patient safety committee that they started in 2018 that they asked us to uh, promote someone to be chosen and he was Arvid Steiner from Norway he has a PhD in safety they love him he lectures at all their meetings and he was reappointed to the committee. Then WHO, they've been really, really good. I really met them, as I said, through Dr. Campbell and then working on the GIST committee, which is now not there because they don't have leadership, so that essential surgery and emergency surgery care. That may be coming back. G4 is the G4 Alliance for Surgery, Trauma, Obstetrics, and Anesthesia. I believe it was born out of a little frustration with slow movement from WHO, which happens. They don't have a lot of funding. They have to use a lot of volunteers. That organization, its first primary board in 2016, I was elected to the board and then elected three years as treasurer. And Dr. Adrian Geld, who was WFSA, is the immediate past president now, was their representative and he was elected secretary for two years. He and I became friends and it has helped. We don't always agree, but he has been in our corner on many times for us and he understands the global look and the need and so I can't say enough about that cooperation and it came from face to face over breakfast over lunch just many talks I can text him he'll text me right back well you know I've always said it's harder to screw somebody you like yeah. and you're very likable <laughs> So it's been a big help to me. Right. And then, yeah. you know, he is the immediate past president of sure. WSA, so he's the one that... The World Federation, right, World so Federation. So Society of Anesthesiologists. Right. Okay. He is the one that had me speaking at their Patient Safety Summit in London in 2019, where I had, I sent him my slides, and I had one big slide about with the elephant. So this is the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. We're at the World College of Surgeons. There were a lot of surgeons. And I said, is this too bold, Adrian, or people don't get mad at you if I bring up the controversy and he said no do it mm. and when we had our last meeting with them in April we sent they sent some agenda items I would call them a little bit fluffy I sent hard items and Adrian and I had a three-hour call before mm. and he said you can ask anything you want and I'm not sure you're gonna get the answer you want but ask away so we did 
we had a little movement, which is good. Then the United Nations has just been huge. They've been so gracious to me and have been thankful of the view and have said many times, please come to Geneva and come to the United Nations. And the people on my committee are great. I, I just can't say enough about that opportunity. For the future, we're still trying to work with more national nursing organizations or what we call NGOs or non-government organizations. Mm -hmm. Because there are many good ones out there doing good global And that'll help our membership if you can mm -hmm. get into those uh, international nursing organizations. Yes. Well, one thing about WFSA, um, we met with them in the 1990s. They invited us to Frankfurt. It was Pascal Rod from France, Ron Call from the U.S., me, and another person on the Education Committee at the time. When we walked in, we were invited to go there. We were like an endangered species in this small room. And then they had to keep bringing in chairs and bringing in chairs because their anesthesiologist representatives from different countries wanted to look at this endangered species. <laughs> so we finally got seated. <laughs> and then the president, who I think was Dr. Vickers at the time, stood up and said, we believe that anesthesia is a practice of medicine. And I looked at Ron, Pascal, we looked at each other, well, this is a short meeting. We can go home because <laughs> we can't practice medicine. Yeah. And they can't either throughout the world. Uh, but we got through it, and it, that was because of um, Honorary Secretary Anna K. Mercy, who I'd spent time in Malawi with at that time in 1999, ran into the wrong mosquito and came home for the World Congress Chicago with malaria, sick as a dog. But at any rate, um, you know, again, it's you, you can get doors open for you when you make these relationships. But that was interesting, and, and my hat's off to Jackie with the relationship they have now, because it's a whole lot better. And you know something? There's enough work for all of us. Isn't that there the is. Not only in this country, but on the global stage. Well, clearly. Yeah. So, all right, Sandy, what's the importance of ICN's advanced practice guidelines for nurse anesthetists? Okay, well, again, because of where Jackie was, she found out that the International Council of Nursing is developing practice guidelines for, for the advanced practice nurse. And they were not, we were not included in that. And so she, in her soft, quiet way, said... Jackie, we, soft and quiet? <laughs> right, All the time. So what happened... <laughs> is we got an what international committee uh, together, and I think Becky Madsen and, and again, Betty Orton was on it. And uh, they wrote uh, practice guidelines for nurse anesthetists, which are now recognized by ICN, which is the oldest, strongest mm. nursing uh, community in, in the world. And that is huge. That is huge again. And w we held up our book that we did um, that was published in 2021 until we had their permission and we could put that in the book as the last chapter, chapter 17, I think. But it clearly defines in a very positive way the nurse specialist in anesthesia throughout the world. And that's there forever. It's published, it's recognized by ICN. If she hadn't been there, no telling what we would be viewed as. Mm -hmm. Gotta be present to win. That's right, that's right. So Jackie, again, kudos, because that was just, that was great. The right people have to be present to win. Right, right. right. We've been very fortunate that both of you have been That's the right true. people. So you talked about the book. What are, what are some of the books that uh, talk about IFNA? Well, you know, one, of course, is The Global Voice of Nurse Nesses, uh, IFNA from 1989 to 2021. There were six people on the historical committee and three co-editors. I had the honor of being a co-editor with Betty Horton again and Jackie. Others on this committee was Hermie Lonard, our founder from uh, Switzerland, Pascal Rod from France, and Susan Kalk, Ron Kalk's uh, wife. And, and we worked four years on that book. Mm. And, um, but we got a lot of pictures in it. It's a 30-year history, and, and I was very pleased with the way that turned out. And then more recently, uh, Jackie found out that ICN was going to be a part with Springer Publishing of a book called Nurse Practitioners and they added Nurse Anesthetists, the evolution of the group roles. So, you know, they're recognizing um, advanced practice nurses now in a global role. 
And I think, Jackie, they said if this book's to be published, you're going to have to include nurse synopsis. Yes. I got a call actually from the NP that was mm -hmm. writing the book and said she was contacted and ICM wanted to add nurse synopsis. And I think partly because we mailed every board member, 14 of them. Their CEO and one for their library, our history book. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at the length of time that the NPs have been in practice globally versus us, we mm -hmm. have a much deeper history. Now the NPs are rising quickly and they need them. So we worked, I worked with uh, Sophia Thomas. I, mm -hmm. her and she was I know Sophia. She take for you. And I'd see her at, at, at uh, ICN meetings. And we worked together and I had very little time, but Sandy's an author, Susan Cox was an we author. We had 100 pages and it, seven That's chapters. That's a lot. Eight, yeah. Eight. Yeah. But we had to do it in a short time. Yeah. We didn't have yeah. much time. And it's a great book. And it was launched, ebook, right before beginning of July. July 1st was the ICM meeting, and they had physical copies. Montreal, right? Montreal. Yep. Oh. And it's a really nice book. Yes. It's awesome that you're getting all this down, um, the history, the way it needs to be um, said. Sandy, you've been there from the beginning with IFNA, mm -hmm. and then Jackie, the role you've taken on. Um, it's so important. It goes back to, again, the recognition, the respect. It's our story being told the way we want it mm -hmm. to be told. Mm -hmm. uh, and so thank you both for doing that. And I know that was a labor of love, the history book, but four years of making, but you had to get it right. That's yes. right. And we ended up with 42 or 43 countries history, which we never thought. I asked Sandy in the beginning, and she said, I'll be happy if we get 28. But that was my right. chapter. So I just kept bugging everyone and sending them individually. We need this from you, even if you don't have anything that's deep. Just give me what you have. And now when I have an anesthesiologist say to me, there's now a nurse anesthetist in wherever. Korea, one said that to me. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? I could spout off the whole mm -hmm. history with Sister Margaret Colmer. Mm -hmm. it, it's like the old nursing thing we say. If it's not documented, it wasn't right. done. Right, right. Well, guess what? It's documented. Nice. And just because you say it, Right. Doesn't make it, you know, it doesn't make it a thing. So, Jackie, now this is kind of exciting. Where are the next regional and world congresses for nurse anesthetists? Our first regional congress was supposed to be held in Nairobi, Kenya, in 2020, and was a casualty of COVID, as some mm. of and then continued to be a casualty of COVID. Mm. And I just found out two days ago, it's actually June 18th through the 20th, 2024, in Nairobi. So there'll be a website, I guess, and registration coming up by December. But I'm very excited because our African colleagues most of the time get their visas denied and they can't come to the World Congress. They can only go to something in Africa. So IFNA gave $25,000 out of our reserves, which is a lot for us, to support this meeting so that they can help bring more nurse anesthetists from it around Africa in. And then we just finished our bid for the 2026 World Congress was our 15th World Congress, and it's going to be in Brisbane, Australia, and it will be phenomenal. We had a great, great visit there. So excited to go. Get, I'm so excited. Getting ready for it already. I'm saving money. I can take some family members. Oh, yes. So what do you see uh, the value of the, a member country such as the AANA and belonging to IFNA? I think we've got lots of good reasons, but... Jackie, before you can get into that, can I say one thing that we probably should have said? You want to know how IFNA is financed. We have two major sources of funds. One, of course, is any benefit we get from a, from a Congress, mm -hmm. which we, we most of the time we do, but we could lose. The other is each country pays annual dues. Now, in the very beginning, it was a very small amount, and so we, we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. In 2004, the structure was changed, and now it's been the same. So high-income countries pay three Swiss francs per active member of their organization. Middle-income countries pay 1.5, and low-income countries pay 0.75 Swiss francs per country member based on the World Bank classification of economic development. And a country is like in the low income, if they can't do it, they can apply and IFNA will help them. And I don't think anyone's ever applied. We just had our first one, Rwanda. This okay, year. well good, I'm glad that they do. And one of the things we're asked often, I was, and then I think you are, Jackie, 
is uh, people in, in our organization, the a &A will ask, how can I be a member of if and mm -hmm. If your local organization, your national organization is a member, you are a member. Because a, &A pays three Swiss francs per member, per active member of a, a And I can tell you that's quite important because if it were not for a, &A financially, there wouldn't be an if and a. We have the most members and, and we support it for a good cause. That's mm -hmm. the only way we are going to have a seat at the table and do these things. So, Jackie, what else do you think? Is Can I just say that's yet another good reason to pay your dues? Oh, yeah. Yes. For the yeah. AANA, &A, yeah. right? Right. Good point. So, your money now goes to when you pay your AANA &A dues, you're supporting the AANA, &A, you're supporting your state association, and, a small and you are very small international. Good person goes to IFA. And so many members don't understand that. I get lots of emails and questions. How can I be a member of IFA? Right, right. Pay your AANA dues. That's what I say. Mm. What else do you think are value for this national organization, the ANA, to be a member? And we've talked about this a lot, Sandy and I, and some of the other leaders in the airport, but it provides an opportunity that you can network with other international organizations and other international nurse and mm -hmm. which is amazing. At the meetings, you meet new friends, you'll stay in touch with them, and they're constantly reaching out to the USCRNAs for advice on anesthesia mm -hmm. and on new equipment and drugs that come out. But it really does provide a cultural exchange then, and we can understand each other better and what's going on around the world. It provides our members an opportunity to speak at World Congresses because when we make the scientific program, then we go out as our reps from each country and say, who's an expert in this, and we try to line up speakers. And I always do go to the AANA and say, who in this topic do you support as an expert? So I think it's very important that whoever's speaking should have state speaking experience, national speaking experience, and be recognized as an expert by your own organization. And it provides us or any other national organization an opportunity to influence develop of education programs and even standards for practice monitoring ethics in other countries. So it is our way to help. Nice. Nice. So as we kind of bring this to a close, since we've all got to be at the foundation luncheon coming up <laughs> and we're hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you give us your closing thoughts on IFNA? Well, I could tell you, I often say, I spent, I've been in anesthesia well over 50 years, have attended at least 50 AMA congresses such as this. And when I look back, I think the first half of my life was spent with AANA, mm -hmm. making it the best that we can make it. But the second half of my life, from 1989, and my heart, has been with IFNA because we live in a global world mm -hmm. and I have not been disappointed at the progress and what Jackie has been able to do. It's been just wonderful uh, to look back and if I had to take this journey again, I would do it the same way wow. every time. It has wow. been just wonderful and Jackie, kudos to you. I thank you so much because she has expanded it to a global organization and people then think, oh, yeah, the nurses, we got to get in touch with Jackie Rawls on that, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. I think when Sandy first talked to me about serving in IFNA, I had no idea what it was going to grow to and how fortunate we were going to be to be sitting at the table, writing, developing, especially now with what's going on with the United Nations. It's surreal sometimes. Well, well, and I think it's so important. To this point, every AINA appointed representative to IFNA CNR has been a former president of the AINA. Mm -hmm. I think it's important from the standpoint that they have had the support and recognition of the membership at large, and they've learned a lot along the way that can then transfer this to the international organization. We have had six presidents only since 1989 of IFNA, and three of them were from the AINA, mm -hmm. Ronald Kalk, me, and then Jackie. So we have a huge footprint in that global mm -hmm. organization, and like I said, without us, it would be hard to sustain it. I remember when we presented, uh, when Paul Santoro was president, and uh, we were presenting about, he wanted to know what our annual budget was, and we, we told him, and 
But Jackie told him, and he said, I have one question. I thought, oh my God, the finance man, here it comes. Mm -hmm. And he said, how do you do so much with so little? Mm -hmm. Because our operating budget is not that much. Yeah, right now and it's probably $170,000. You, you know what we say? Wow. We have no staff. We have no staff. Well, we have. Well, well yeah, we have two. We have part time executive director and equivalent to a point two FTE. And then we do pay our APAP manager, but it's per program that comes through. Right. And there's a limit of $10,000. And, and so it's a little bit. Yeah. But other than that, it's all done by volunteers. Mm -hmm. Wow. From around the world. Well, so that's how you do so li you do so, so much, much with, some, with so little financially, but so much with volunteerism that's and people right. who want to see it right. succeed. That's right. That is right. And, the and passion. The, the CRNAs here, our members, are amazing mm -hmm. because if I need to reach out to someone for content expertise or to look at something for me, there's a whole list of people that want to help. Yes. Well, we want to thank the both of you for coming here today and for everything that you've done for the profession and keeping us in the forefront on the global stage. So, and above and beyond that, I mean, Sandy's been my mentor for a very, very long time. We won't tell how long. And <laughs> yes, well, all of us in this room. And then, of course, Jackie. You know. I'm just sitting here as a fan girl right yeah. now. So, <laughs> well, um, so I, I guess that's a wrap. So, thanks for listening to Beyond the Mass with the absent Jeremy Stanley, myself, Sharon Pierce, and guest co host Tracy Castleman. If you like our show and want to help us grow, the Tracy, best way. <laughs> Tracy, can you tell <laughs> on our paper, on our cheat sheet, folks, it's got Jackie's, Jackie's name because Jackie's going to co host. <laughs> so, so sorry if Tracy's getting messed up because oh. she's seeing Jackie's name. <laughs> well, I'm going to be Jackie Rolls for a moment. I know you're well, all very jealous. jealous. <laughs> Actually, oh. we might just leave that in there. <laughs> the best way to help uh. is to like the show, share it on social media, tell your friends and co workers, and leave a review, but make it positive as Jeremy says we all know that there is enough negativity in the world beyond the mask is in the top 50 medical podcasts in the country and number one in the crna community thank you to all our listeners until the next time hey crnas it's time to simplify your continuing education Welcome to CRNAeducation.com, your trusted provider for CPC core modules and a plethora of Class A CE credits. You can explore 43 detailed articles covering various anesthesia topics, all from your favorite device, anytime, anywhere. And with over 40 pharmacology CE credits, meet your state board requirements effortlessly. Whether you need a few credits or everything to recertify, we have what you need. Just complete your credits online without any subscriptions or recurring charges. You can trust in our 100% CRNA-owned platform, established in 2011, ensuring you receive the best in customer service and educational content. Ready to learn? Go to crnaeducation.com, making continuing education easy and accessible. And don't forget that support is always a quick email or a text or phone call away. To sign up and learn more, just go to crnaeducation.com. Today's show is brought to you by the folks at CRNA Financial Planning, an independent consulting firm that offers financial planning services exclusively to CRNAs and their families. From planning for a child's future college expenses to building a predictable income stream in retirement, the firm is committed to offering you comprehensive financial services, customized to fit your unique needs and objectives. If you have questions about your financial future, get them answered. Call the team at 855-304-3748. That's 855-304-3748. Or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. Hi, this is Jackie Rolls, President of the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists and President and Founder of Our Hearts, Your Hands, a global anesthesia support community that takes donations to allow nurse anesthetists in low and middle income countries to go to educational programs, buy equipment or textbooks. 
Your donations are tax deductible and we would appreciate your support. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you like to listen to shows. Also, be sure to check out beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Each episode is posted there with a corresponding blog post, and we timestamp important parts of the episode to help you quickly get to the content you're looking for. Also, check out the special series section on the site. You can follow along and catch up on the CRNA History Series, episodes specifically about political conversations in the industry, or try the CRNA Personal Finance Series. It's all on beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And if you have a question for the show or want to be a guest or even suggest a particular topic, fill out the contact form on the site or send an email directly to us at info at beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And lastly, let's take the conversation social. Check out our Beyond the Mask podcast Facebook page and Facebook group.